sir now we can start we are starting our meeting today we are the collaboration session of world endoscopic spine foundation with assi that is the association of spine surgeons of india i welcome you all and i ask uh, dr same al hasan morsi to give a brief introduction about world federation of spine endoscopy before we start this meeting dr same can you come on please dr same you are there brother yes i am here do you okay. hear me can hear you same we can see you and hear you can you please start Okay. Do you see my slide? Yes, we see your slide. Thank you. Good day for uh, every one of you. I am uh, Dr. Samah Hanousi from Egypt, President of World Federation of Spine Endoscopy. World Federation of Spine Endoscopy is the biggest international organization for spine endoscopy worldwide. We have, I am the only founder for uh, this association with the great advisor, Dr. Malcolm Bistongi. If you don't know about it, please Google it. And we have so far 10 international courses, including cadaveric dissection and the four annual congresses. Last one was in June 2022. And we have more than 120 international faculty joined us in last Congress. It was endorsed by multiple international organizations of neurosurgery and spine endoscopy, more than 14. It was also joined by more than 30 countries, more than 300 delegates have joined us in our past Congress. And we have endorsed many international courses worldwide. In coming January and February, we have ESICON and Endoscopic Spine Workshop in Pakistan and in Turkey. And I'd like to ask you to join our Fifth World Federation of Spine Endoscopy in coming June from 6 to 8th June. Three days of more than 200 lectures and one day of full cadaveric course. At the end, I'd like to thank my dear brother, Malcolm Bistongi, for starting association and collaboration with ASSI and being the best advisor ever. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think we will now start with our program. So may I please request Professor Kim from yes. South Korea to start his talk. Yes. Yes. He is considered as a genius in his work with monoportal spine surgeries. He is the master who has seen the evolution of spine surgery from its primitive stages through the transforaminal stages to the monoportal stages. And it is our pleasure to hear. Professor Kim, can you please start? Hey, can you hear my sound? Yes, sir. We can hear you and see you well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, it is my great honor to give a talk in uh, uh, ASCON uh, conference. And uh, thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Malcolm Pestonji to invite me. Uh, this time my topic is technical tips of unipotal endoscopy post lateral transforaminal mitral fusion. As uh, there have uh, two kind of endoscopic uh, uh, unipotal uh, mitral fusion technique of uh, transcambian approach and post lateral approach, and also. Uh, previously, we think about it, the uh, uh, post-lateral approach maybe from uh, 
inside out outside but nowadays i am doing the uh, outside in approach and uh, there are these two techniques have a uh, advantage and disadvantage among them the uh, postural approach postural lateral approach this approach has uh, more uh, advantage compared to the trans can be approach due to the uh, sufficient decompression is possible and also the indication is not limited and all kind of uh, degenerative disease that need fusion can possible apply uh, this postural approach and also in this paper you can see uh, the uh, technique of uh, inside out and outside in approach i used this kim's point and drilling from the outside in uh, to a resected inferior process and also skin is uh, uh near always always uh, some lateral part of the upper pedicle and ducking to the uh, in, uh, media uh, of the facet area and also you can see this paper of the uh uh, uh, showing the uh, safety delivery system of the cage stem in spite of the unipotal uh, full endoscopic, endoscopic irumbine interval fusion, this Helsing cage glider. And also this paper talking that uh, more uh, easily a resection technique of inferior process from outside in Kim's point. And also this uh, paper talking that uh, uh, using the sufficient uh, end plate denudation the endoscopic room interval fusion has more advantage uh, of the higher fusion rate compared to the open transform room interval fusion. And there have a distinctive advantage of the endoscopic room inter interval fusion due to the endoscopic uh, interval fusion uh, can uh, more uh, close operate to the uh, chronic adhesive this point uh, we can uh, resect the sufficiently chronic adhesive uh, this uh, point and also another uh, advantage can give the uh, sufficient end plate to demonstration because of this two distinctive advantage uh, the endoscopy room interval fusion can take a, a more sufficient clinical result and radiological result compared to the open transform room interval fusion here you can see the safety delivery uh, procedures of the uh, Harrison KG glider firstly uh, sorry ducking uh, like this way and uh, rotate like this way and uh, there is a maker uh, uh, to protect the traversing and acting over to together you can see here and also nowadays uh, i use the 3d print kg to enhance the high fusion rate and it already well known that the 3D printed KG have a higher fusion rate compared to the previous uh, peak KG and metal KG. And also you can see like these cases of uh, R5S1, uh, highly, uh, highly uh, migrated cases and highly retro research cases, uh, not easy in open surgery, but uh, it need a, a sufficient re re reduction of this kite and make a sufficient uh, lumbar lodotic angle. Uh, endoscopic lumbar interval fusion can possible due to a sufficient chronic adhesive disc drilling. And also you can see this uh, X-ray show the sufficient reduction of the uh, high, uh, high uh, retros uh, spondylosis cases. And also this paper talking, uh, Dong Chan Lee talking that uh, in spite of the uh, high fusion rate, L5S and L45 have uh, some substance rate because of that. Uh, sometimes we can try the two K insertion technique. Nowadays it is very easily. And this post operative uh, skin insertion of full skin. I use the same skin insertion of the uh, pedicle screw uh, uh, insertion. Uh, this operative process. Firstly, ducking, and then uh, expose the uh, inferior process and the uh, lateral uh, facet area. And uh, firstly, seeking the Kim's point and the drilling fastly, and then uh, resect IAP uh, easily. And then uh, SAP also same method from lateral to medial, medial to lateral, and then can uh, resect the SAP more easily. Then you can insert to the working channel to the uh, uh, frame area, uh, 
Uh, then during this disk chronic adhesive disk, you can see uh, severe collapse disk more uh, easily uh, release the uh, restoration of this kite. And finally, uh, end plate uh, denudation can make uh, then uh, uh, enhance the uh, higher fusion rate. And uh, we can insert a two kg like this way. And the clinical result, uh, you can see this paper. Uh, the uh, uh, Due to this advantage, we can take a uh, uh, sufficient uh, focal uh, segmental correction, uh, sufficient uh, disc height restoration, sufficient uh, spondyl restasis reduction is very, very nice compared to the open spine surgery. And also, this paper also talking that uh, using this uh, end plate denudation and uh, sufficient uh, chronic adhesive disc drilling, we can make a high uh, sufficient fusion light. And uh, you, you can, this case is only one year, uh, make a sufficient fusion in spite of the uh, endoscope fusion. And also, uh, recently, we take uh, another advantage. Uh, due to the we can insert a large angle, the 3D print KG, you can this paper talking that uh, uh, indirect decompression like uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, cases and this case, uh, not a decompression of the contralateral and equilateral together. Uh, uh, finally, you can see the spinal canal reduced and contractor <laughs> frame also in direct <laughs> compression is possible. This another advantage is that uh, due to the uh, the characteristics of the uh, radio frequency and uh, it make uh, some vegetal neuropathy ablation and paraspinal muscle relaxation due to we can make a sufficient uh, paraspinal muscle preservation and sometimes paraspinal muscle uh, reco uh, web uh, 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 is possible. And also, uh, I will see some of cases so you can see the high uh, severe collapse uh, spondylolisthesis cases. So you can see two cage insertion and after sp spinal alignment corrected very, very well. And also, you can see these cases, uh, it looks like not easy. But uh, with only this uh, two level endoscopic lumbar intervallic fusion, you can see the spinal alignment corrected very, very well. And also, these cases, uh, uh, lateral uh, 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 vibration and uh, hybrid spondyl recess also using endoscopic lumbar interval fusion, you can see the uh, reduction is uh, decompression and reduction is very, very nice to this, like these cases. And also, this case is, is a failed back cases and after uh, limbed implant and inserted KJ2 here, you can make a uh, sufficient uh, uh, alignment correction and the patient uh, very well clinical result in spite of the uh, long-term follow-up. And also this case is my final cases. Uh, due to the endoscopic lumbar interval fusion has uh, completely preserved the structures or like, uh, not only facet, uh, uh, ligament, uh, muscle, and facet, and all structures, and uh, but also the, the can uh, preserve the skin. Uh, we can give the to, uh, to the patient their spontaneous reduction chance. You can see this patient preoperatively. Uh, the patient uh, have a so severe pain uh, more than three months due to chronic disc discitis uh, due to the patient needed for level fusion and that operation you can see the spinal element corrected and six months and the one year and two year the uh, spinal alignment corrected spontaneously and the patient have no ASD problem and also Due to this advantage, I believe that in the future we can possible. Uh, sorry. Uh, no open surgery, no shoot after operation, no dressing after operation, no transfusion during operation, no general anesthesia, and then minimizing the infection after operation. I uh, opened my hospital four months ago. Uh, I performed uh, about uh, 100 cases fusion surgery, but uh, still we have no open surgery. No suture, no dressing, no transfusion, no general anesthesia, and no infection. 
And I believe that uh, uh, now we uh, endoscopic spine surgery developed so much, but still going ongoing state. But I believe that uh, some things changed uh, abruptly, like uh, endoscopic spine surgery. Believe that uh, changed the world uh, for degenerative spine, not only degenerative spine, but also many uh, spinal disease patients. Thank you for your kind attention. You said that was perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing work, sir. It is a privilege and honor to have you with us, sir. I will now request the next speaker, Dr. Park. And uh, sir, I will, uh, Dr. Kim, I request you to stay online because after the third talk, we have a discussion. So, Dr. Park. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. And can you see? Can you see me? Can you see the uh, presentation? My presentation. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and I would like to express my gratitude to all the ASCO <coughs> faculty for making this possible. I would like. To, I also would like to extend my special thanks for Professor Pestonji. Our esteemed chair for his uh, invaluable contribution and support. Today, my topic is uh, bipolar endoscopic surgery for the decompression of a thoracic uh, ossification of a ligament problem. As we know, ossification ligament problem is uh, one of the main cause of thoracic myelopathy and is uh, more common, more frequent in the East Asia, Japan, Taiwan, and Korea. And uh, typically, these are combined, combined with lumbar spinal canal stenosis, especially over, over the 70%. And also very commonly combined with cervical canal spinal canal stenosis. So radiology, it is a uh, uh, occupational liver problem start from the capsular portion and extend the, from the capsular portion to the extend to the medial part like this. And also start from the posterior part to the move to the anterior part. And uh, before operation, it is very helpful to know there are, uh, there are dural ossification. In our, the study of our hospital, also preoperative uh, study is started. There are over the po nearly 40% of dural ossification there. So for the decompression, bipolar endoscope surgery is one of the best uh, methods for the decompression surgery. So as we know, knee surgery, knee arthroscopic surgery is moved to the spine, just like this. And we can make what the chamber on the knee, knee cavity with a press or water press like this. But uh, on the spine, spine canal is connected to the uh, cranial. So if you fail the control of uh, outflow, the pressure of or surgical field increase the hardly, and it, it can make uh, some big problem in the cranial, delay the okay, awakening, so seizure-like activity, and other things. So for successful operation, uh, it, um, I, I, have, uh, I have many experience for uh, decompression surgery over the OLF. Uh, so I would like to recommend, highly recommend, make your surgery step, stage, drilling stage, and the separation of ligament problem stage, and the removal of ligament problem. So, and the other important thing is uh, please make uh, your uh, pathology with the joining. Joining is very, very important. Compression area, compression area is a high, high risk area. And the intermediate area is a normal ligament problem. And the safety area is a medial wall, lateral to the medial, medial pedicure wall line. So here is your safety area, and here is your dangerous area, and here is your intermediate area. Uh, if you do, if you perform your operation after making joint, it is very, very helpful, and your operation will be, will be successful and without any damage or injury to the spinal cord. So drilling stage is most important. Drilling stage is most important. From the medial wall of pedicle to the make a, 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 like a drillings, 
middle wall paper drillings and the uh, isolation of uh, iso separation origin problem to the Y shape separation. So extendable your lateral drilling is a uh, uh, superior articular process. Right lateral limitation is a right uh, superior articular process. Lef left lateral limitation is a left superior articular process. Personally, I have I have uh, 94 cases and uh, about 120 levels of uh, decompression of uh, ossification ligand flavor with a bifotinoscopic systems. So I, I would like to talk about personally immobile Dear, yeah, this is a, uh, when you drill, when you drill the pedicle here, we can find the medial wall of pedicle, medial wall of pedicle like this. And we extend the, our drillings, remove uh, drillings to the medial wall of pedicle line here, like just like this. This line is a shaped line, shaped line, and separate your legal flame and Y shape like this and the drilling like this. This is a surgical flow of my surgery. This is skin, post of skin incision and uh, uh, location for the skin incision is the most important. And uh, I, I like to have a uh, uh, transverse skin incisions like this. And uh, for the good outflow, I use a trocus. I told it again, with the water pressure, we can make water uh, surgical field. Uh, usually I start the spiro-laminar junction, drilling start the laminar junctions, and expose the ligam to flab with the drills. I like, in the early stage of my operation, I use it to the side cutting drill bar, side cutting drill bar, with the, which is a self-suction horse. We, as we know, we can fly just like just like a butterfly. So here is a exposure of a head of a butterfly. I'm drilling lateral end of uh, yeah here IAP. If you drill the IAP, you can find the SAP on contralateral side, and also exposure with this exposure with this corner. This corner is also important, and I'm drill here. And the separation of ligand flow with the Y shape. Y shape separation of ligand flow is very important. So this is a drilling stage. Let me, uh, yeah, and uh, and then you can you can remove in the not severe case, not severe case, uh, mild case, we can remove the ligand flow with the, just like two piece, right side uh, ligand flow removal. And the left side ligand flow. This is a case for the mild case. After drilling, after drilling, complete drilling, and then remove the ligand flow. That is uh, my talk today. After completing your drilling, and then please remove second ligand flow. This is a case for the mild. I remove the left side. Uh, uh, a thick on the ligand flame. Well, the, we are worried about the water pressure during the during the, my surgery. When the outflow is the occlusion, if you open the outflow, the pressure of uh, spinal cord is decreased, decreased here. So making outflow, making outflow is the most important. This is a case for the more severe case. This is a case for severe. Actually, this patient had two level severe cannula stenosis. Same, the, my message is the same. After reading IAP and the exposure of SAP, and then uh, removal, removal of SAP on the safety angle. Here is a safe zone. Removal of SAP with the safe zone, and, uh, and the removal. Only pull out, not push it. Only pull out, take out, pull out without compression of a can spinal cord. It's very important. Don't please don't insert your don't insert your instrument in the compression area, dangerous area. Only please insert. We can insert the intermediate, no compression area. Here is your no compression area, so we can remove it like this. 
So no compression of uh, danger zone during the during the operation is the most important. This is the most severe case. There is no dura here, no dura here, no dura. Yeah, dura and the ligand flow is uh, one piece, yeah, one component. But we can prevent the arachnoid membrane. It's very, very important. With the removal, we can remove the ossified ligand flow with the dura, with the preservation of arachnoid membrane. So, and then we can, we can patch it with the taco seal. In a fibrin, fibrin taco cell, we can fetch like multiple layer like this. So we can remove the ossification with dura, with the preservation of with the preservation of uh, arachnoid membrane, and the sealing with the patch method, fibrin silantin with the fibrin silantin. This is a fibrin silantin. I will talk. This is a OLF with dura is a fused, but with the water pressure, we can separate the OLF with the preservation, preservation of arachnoid membrane, and we can repair this method. This is a method of, my method for the most severe case. So this is a post of two months later, after fibrin silantin. This is a fibrin silantin with the preservation of arachnoid membrane. This is a post of cases, my case, two levels decompression. Also, two level malophasy, but with a bipolar, will be the technique. Drilling, bones, and the separation of the flavor, and the removal of the flavor. Make a stage, and the make a zoning is very important. This is also also operative CTs here and uh, fully operative CTs and the 3D post office 3D CTs here. Today my talk is uh, don't don't compress the uh, dangerous area during your operation. Only pull out pull out the pathology pathology after drilling and separation of origin flame. Uh, in the early stage, only one patient, or one of my patients uh, uh, complained the post-operative weakness compared to preoperative. But other, other patients have uh, some tolerable outcomes. outcomes. And uh, I'm very worried about the post-operative uh, hematoma. Uh, hematoma. So, so Always I did, I did uh, immediate post-operative MRI. When we have uh, M, uh, operation, the same day night, I checked the uh, post-operative MRI to prevent the post-operative hematoma corrections. So my, my talk is uh, please uh, make uh, your operation stage, drilling stage is the most important. Drilling your bones, IAP and SAP. And separating your ligand from flavor and the safety area and the removal. Removal is the real problem. Try to remove angular. Angular removal is the most important. That is my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Park. Amazing. Fantastic analysis of the thoracic spine. And uh, the zones of working was real application of mine. Fantastic talk, sir. Sir, so without wasting time, now I will go to Dr. Pompavit to start with his talk. And after that, we have a seven minutes discussion session. We will be taking any questions and answers and then proceeding with the next session. Yeah, without wasting time, I request you to please start your talk, sir. Yeah. Good, good afternoon. So, yeah, sir. I cannot share my screen. Eh? Please let me share my screen. Yeah, please share your screen, sir. Yes. Take your time, sir. Okay, okay. And first of all, I would like to say thank you for Markham uh, to have me here and uh, hope you have the uh, good time for the Mercury, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year soon. <laughs> okay, I still cannot share. Huh? Please help me. Huh? Please allow me to share my screen. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. 
Dr. Park, you will have to uh, stop sharing your screen, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. You'll have to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Are you okay? Dr. Dr. Pompavit, go ahead and now share your screen, sir. Okay. Yeah, we can see you, sir. You. Fantastic. Okay, you can see my screen right now. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you again. And my topic today is alternative approaches for uh, uniportal endoscopic in foraminal and extra foraminal pathologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new is not new, but it's modification for UC approach is the posterior oblique approach. And for example, this case is the the foraminal this and extra foraminal this. And if you see on the coronal view, you can see they have two parts. One is the extra foraminal zone, this herniation, and another one is the foraminal zone, this herniation in the same case. So this is the conventional and foraminal approach. Normally we perform under local anesthesia, but in some cases, the patient cannot tolerate the local injection. So they ask us to perform under general anesthesia. So we need to have the intraoperative nerve monitoring because of the cambi angle is quite narrow. And also the, the insert, the needle is the insert by full fulloscopy, but it's by as well. So we, we have the many indication for the transformer approach in the past, particularly the, the alpha S1 HNP with the high lighting. Uh, in that case, it's very difficult situation for the transformer approach. So we have to do the outside in technique. So let let's let's see the the conventional technique. We approaching to the superior border of the lower pedicle because is this alley is far away from the nerve root, and then we we put the dilator in and we we put the endoscope. Then we can approaching to the foraminal zone. Okay, according to the Gantek Lim, he proposed the paramedi approach. Is the is the same purpose to approach to the foraminal area. And his technique is a little bit oblique, but he the core of this technique is docking to the isthmus, docking to the isthmus. Okay, let you see the isthmus. The is isthmus have the the, the reticular artery and beneath the pass is the nerve root. So if you use the, this approach, you have to be careful because you may be injury to the reticular artery. And if you're drilling the pass, keep in mind beneath the pass is the nerve root, like this. And my suggestion is the posterior oblique lateral approach. So this purpose is to, to perform under general anesthesia because some pa patient cannot tolerate the rojo uh, injection. But without the intraoperative nerve monitoring because in the, it's a cause. Uh, okay, and let's say this is the par paramedic approach, the dogging in the isthmus, but my approach is dogging on the lateral part of the SAP. Or in some case, we dogging to the TP, the transport process is quite easy. Uh, look at this. We docking. This is a paramedia, right? On the isthmus, and then go up, and then identify the nerve root. My suggestion is docking the SAP, and go down to the TP and along the pedicle to the disc. Or the alternative is dock on the on the TP, and then you along the pedicle go to the, the disc space. It's quite safe because uh, it's away from the nerve root. And some cases you can blur, you can drill the SAP to widening the volumen. And also you can drill the pass to enchant the interspinal uh, canal. Let, let I show the little bit technique. You can see I tilt the C arm oblique around 20 degree. And I dock my dilator to the SAP, something like that. And then I palpate the ischmus 
and then palpate SAP and TP. Okay, now we push the dilator to the TP. And then in the case, you can see this case, they have the up migration fragment, they have the foraminal fragment, and also they have the ecta foraminal fragment as well. So which approach is good for this case? If you look at the, the you, you can see, they have three parts of the disc fragment in three, you see, if you use the, the inter lamina approach, you can remove the disc inter spinal canal, but really difficult to remove the foraminals, but can, but difficult. But extra foraminal is quite difficult for the inter lamina approach. But if you perform time foraminal approach, also difficult to remove the up migration the fragment. So I suggest you to oblique lateral approach down to the SAP or pass uh, or transfer process. And then you remove the SAP and then you can decompression the foramen, remove the this fragment in the foramen and extra foramen. And then you remove some part of the isthmus approaching to the the, the application fragment and remove it. Okay. I set up the CM um, at, at allow 20 degree to identify the facet. And you can see, you can identify the spotty dog on the CM. Um, and then put the, your dilator into the SAP. And then follow through the pedicle. And you can identify the, the medial bounds of the, the dorsal MIs. And I recommend you to, to make the lysotomy in this step something like that, and then follow the pedicle, and then you can oppose to the foramen. And you can oppose to both uh, traversing nerve root and uh, exiting nerve root in the same uh, approaching. You can see we can achieve the very, very good area for the endolip as well. Okay, I, I, I would like to show you the the short video to, to show, to summarize the step. Like this case is the application as well. We perform posterior approach. In some case, the SAP quite large, so we have to remove some parts of the SAP first, and then, and then now we can approach to the transfer process. Right. This is the transfer process. You can identify the middle bands of the dorsal MI. Uh, I recommend to make the lysotomy by cut the nerve. And also you can use this uh, approach to make the, the lysotomy as well. Okay, after that, you cut some parts of the transfer process, go down to uh, to the foramen, and then you can identify the in, entire foraminal ligament, remove the ligament, And immediately you can you can identify the this uh in the vertebral disc. And you go up, you can see the exiting nerve root. If you go medially, you have to remove some part of the medial border of the the pedicle. And then And then remove some parts of the part in the case of you want to go to remove the up migration, this fragment. And remove the, the lateral ligamentum fevum. Okay, and then go to medially. Remove the lateral fevum. Then you, you can identify the traversing nerve root in this area. After re you remove the medial part of the, the fevum, that uh, traversing the nerve root. And go a little bit upward. And this is the axilla area. You can see the this extrusion.
then this is the application this fragment and you confirm by the C arm in WDIP. And then you can remove the application disk without dealing the, the pedicle, only the remove some parts of the past in the articular disk. And this is the disk fragment. Okay, the disk fragment removed and we stop the bidding to to check, no, this fragment remain in, in the entire spinal canal. Okay, we go laterally and see this is a foraminal disc fragment, right? And then we can remove the lateral disc fragment by the same approach. Okay, this approach also good for the endolip as well. So I, I don't want to talk about the indication. Oh, this is the K-lip, right? We go to the Tan cabin, this very narrow area. And if you perform the Tan facet T-lip, your placement of the case is not uh, in the good position, not middly enough. And the, is my suggestion is the Oslo oblique lateral approach, and you can see I put the pedicle screw first and I put the case later because I got two cases uh, that I, I decompression first and I put the screw uh, after I have the pedicle uh, crack and fracture. So I avoid this by put the pedicle screw first. And this is, uh, this is uh, our technique, something like that. Okay. And also I use the Hallison uh, a two to perform this uh, surgery. Thank you for Harrison. <laughs> and you can see you the, so yeah. and also the we can perform the contralateral decompression as well in this approach. So con in conclusion, uh, we have the good candidate for many uh, indications. And also the advantage is not the bi technique. We can access to the foramen. Uh, maybe safer and have more room to entry than go to the cabin triangle. And I hope this uh, technique maybe maybe uh, may, may, maybe you can extend to the spinal canal as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. What a wonderful talk, sir. What a wonderful talk. I have thank you. A lot of. Uh, Surgery similar to you in using UB to remove up migrated fragments. And yeah. Those up on Facebook also. So I was thinking across the continents, they seem to <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. We have yeah. some, if there are any questions from the audience, we are welcome to take them. Otherwise, I have a couple of questions. One question is to Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, I really appreciate it. Actually, it's not a question, it's an appreciation that you have adapted rather than a vertical approach, an oblique approach, and that you have uh, opened up the facet joint from within, expanding inside and then outside. That really opens up the entire area of the Cambin's triangle for me. And uh, it will help you to, my understanding is that it helps you to take care of a lot of other associated pathologies and gives you a very safe and a corridor going into the center of the disc. So I think that adaptation by you is a very fantastic adaptation, Dr. Kim. This was my observation of your talk and I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Park, I had a small uh, question for you. In your patients with very severe O, have you had a significant improvement in spasticity? I believe the pain goes away. The VAS score improves, but the spasticity does not improve in my series of patients. So I wanted to know your opinion regarding your patients. Yeah, actually, most of my patients has uh, not severe symptoms. Unfortunately, I don't have experience for spasticity treatment. Okay. Most of my patient is uh, weakness, weak, subjective weakness. And, uh, so, yeah. So... I don't have uh, the experience for uh, treating spasticity. Sorry for that. Okay, no, no, okay. So thank you, sir. That is just wanted to know that. 
Dr. Pompavit, I have no question for you. I don't think the audience has put up any questions. So we can go ahead with our next session. I would like yeah. to thank Dr. Imjinwa. I think he has joined us. Dr. Imjinwa, are you there with us? Can you please put on your speaker, sir? You put, unmute yourself. And can we have you can share the screen, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Imjinwa. Come, sir. Oh. Okay, nice to meet you. Okay, <laughs> looks very well. Looks good. Okay, okay. So, can you roll? Yes, we can. Yes. can... Okay, can you see my slide? Yes, sir, we can see you. Okay, can I start? Please do, sir. Thank you. Nice to meet you, everybody. Hello, everybody. My name is Jin Aum. Now I'm working in Al College Hospital in UAE. Yeah, thank you for, especially thank you for Dr. Malcolm and, and giving me a, this nice chance. Okay. Okay, today my topic is current state of bipolar endoscopic spine surgery. This is my disclosure, okay? Seeing is believing, yeah. And already you know, the bipolar endoscopic principle is the same as uh, knees and shoulder surgery. But difference is there is no working space in the spine, that's the problem. Yeah, you know, the Argentina doctor, D. Anthony first, this technique introduced this word, 1996. And this is original article. And at that time, they did surgery, uh, lateral position. And fortunately, I have a chance to meet and chance to know Dr. Abdul Gapa 2001, and he's my teacher. And after then, uh, I and my student, Dr. Son, changed it and established we uh, applied radio friction device and we changed the prone position and we make some instrument. There is a big establishment and development in Korea. So during 10 years, there are a big change. So I dare say there is a learning curve. Level one is uh, herniated disc. Level two is unilateral limnotomy and bilateral compression and revision surgery. Level three, endoscopic dural repair and foraminal decompression and cervical discectomy, thoracic decompression and control lateral approach and endoscopic fusion. And level four, extreme tilt surgery and cervical lateral mass screw fixation and future, we don't know yet. But this is my personal opinion. And I show the cases, coronated disc cases. The procedure is, as you know, as you see, the same as open surgery, minimally invasive microsurgery, we have to do laminotomy and pharabectomy, and we can see the rupture disc, and we can remove the rupture disc fragment. But as you see, the surgical view is very different. So can you see uh, this kind of picture in the microscopic surgery? I don't think so. In the microscopic surgery, we have to control breathing and we have to retract more. But in endoscopic surgery, we don't need retraction. And we can see the, the root and around the root area and ruptured pathologic disc clearly. That's the big difference. So this reason, uh, seeing is believing. If you don't agree, but I believe seeing is believing. And next case is uh, next level is, I dare say, L45 stenosis because about 10 or 15 years before, uh, when we first start uh, doing uh, endoscopic surgery at that time, only uh, in the world, there is only one portal endoscope. There is no bipolar endoscope introduced. At that time, uh, with endoscopic surgery, we cannot solve the stenotic stenosis problems at that time. Only we can solve disc rupture, the disc problem only with the one portal endoscope. So there was a challenge, but 
10 years before we tried to do uh, decompress the stenosis problems. So we applied the concept of unilateral laminotomy and bilateral decompression, bilateral decompression surgery. So now it is very easy to solve the stenosis problem with bipolar endoscopic surgery. So we can remove hypertrophied renal problem and we can decompress the uh, bony stenosis department. No problems. We can use any kind of drill on keratin longers. No problems. There is a big difference, and we can use any kind of instrument. Okay, and also the surgical view is beautiful. We can see the contralateral part without any disturbance. Also, breathing control problem, and with uh, under the normal cell line situation, we can see the the root and pathology department without serious breathing. There's, there is a big difference. So I and Dr. Ho and Sang Yu Song published this article. And next level, I think level three is herniated disc problem, herniated cervical disc problem. Especially in this MRI, use, uh, you can observe uh, right side, this is right side, right side, C67, herniated disc problem, okay? In this case, what is your gold standard approach? Do you recommend if you are, this patient is your family member, do you recommend ACDF or posterior endoscopic approach? If your family member, your daughter or your mother, how can you recommend ACDF? I don't recommend. I think the first choice of surgery, this kind of patient should be first choice of patient with first choice of operation should be changed to endoscopic decompression. Right? We have to change. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. okay. So C67, right side approach. So a little different, but at first time, I have to remove the laminotomy and the foraminotomy. But uh, the surgical view is very clear. And we can see the cervical nerve very clearly. And one portal endoscopic surgery and bipolar endoscopic surgery is a little different. With one portal endoscopic surgery, uh, we can do this kind of uh, dissection. We can do it, but instrument handling is not easy. It's not free. So sometimes we can remove the ruptured fragment with one portal endoscope. But one portal endoscopic surgeon does not agree with my opinion. Sorry about that, but you can do it. But uh, sorry, but so you can see. So we can remove the ruptured disc fragment. And we can manipulate cervical nerve without the root damage. And also surgical view is very beautiful. Okay, we, we can move the cervical nerve, no problem. But don't retract cervical nerve too much. We have to be very careful. And you can use the hook, explore around the cervical nerve. If there is a remnant the disc is there, you can remove, no problem. There is a big difference, I think, with one portal and bipolar endoscopic surgery. And level three also, we try to do fusion surgery under endoscopic surgery. So principle and procedure is the same as T-lip surgery. So you can do laminotomy and disectomy and decompressive foraminotomy and pastectomy. And we can put a cage into the intra discal space without serious number of damage. But there is problem because this procedure should be done under normal cell line. So we worried about it at that time, okay? But there is no serious complications. And now we can use a dual portal endoscope, a dual portal expandable cage, a dual expandable cages, 3D cages. Mm -hmm under dual portal endoscope. In America, they developed uh, expandable cage 
And I use this in the in this area, and it's very nice, but a little expensive. So that's the problem. But there is uh, it is a very nice cage anyway, but price is very very high. So that's the problem. So Dr. Ho and Dr. Son and I uh, published this article, Fully Endoscopy Lumbar Fusion. There's no serious problems with, under endoscopic control. So next level, I think uh, I can, we can use a large only cage through the endoscopic control. This possible preoperative positive MRI, we can use a large cage. We can put a large cage into the L45, L5 SN level. So this is L45 level. Procedure the same as T-lip surgery, but we have to remove the part, facet joint totally. That's the difference. So because we have to expose the Cambridge the triangle totally, we have to see the exiting and transversing the root clearly. So this is exposed Cambridge triangle. You can see the transversing and exiting the root clearly. And disectomy. But we can use the ordinary spine instrument without any problems. So retraction the transverse loop the root mediary. And we can try trial in 45. And Venus is 18. And we can put a large early cage under the endoscopic control without the number of damage. And 45, 15, and 6 degree rotati or leakage. And we have to do trans, uh, transverse and anterior line of cage. I call it posterior orthogonal maneuver. So we can put a large cage, line, anterior, and transversely. Also, L5 SN level, there is no problem. Fortunately, L5 SN level, if we remove the facet joint totally, we can get uh, enough space bigger than the 18 or 20 or sometimes 21. That means we can use a large only or only cage without the root damage. So you can see the exiting double root, and you can use the calcium lungers, and you can use a shaver and all kind of open surgery instrument without any limitation. Also, you can use a large cure for end -pre preparation. But about the end -pre preparation problems, uh, we have to discuss later. And we can put a large case. This is the Venus is 18. So without the root damage, L5 is on level. Very safely, we can do, we can use a large early cage. But sometimes we have uh, we have some difficult to moving the cage, line the cage anterior and posterior line, anterior transverse line. Sometimes we have problem. So this is post-operative X-ray. Looks nice. So. Dr. Ho and R, I uh, published this article in 2021. And level four will be a uh, cervical lateral muscular fixation. It's not easy, it takes a long time. We have to uh, develop some nice instrument for this procedure, but it takes to, the operation time is too long time. I don't recommend it right now. So we have to think, we have to reveal the pros of endoscopic spine surgery, or did you know? We can get a nice enhanced visualization, no need retraction, and also less soft tissue damage. And we can do possible complete decompression around the nerve root. And especially for the obese patient, we have very good, very good, nice advantages. 
and we can do possible with under local anesthesia. And endoscopic surgery is one of the factor of ERAS. So obesity is pandemic, okay? So we can do endoscope surgery under obese, uh, no problems with the obese patient. But we have some problems. So there is no working space. We have to make a working space. It's not easy. It looks easy, but not easy. Also water-based surgery and multiple levels we can do, it, but it takes time. I don't recommend. So there is a learning curve. We have to be very careful. So this is my personal comparison. Surgical view is between, uh, surgical view is very nice, I think, okay. Microsurgery compared to microsurgery and PLD. So about the instrument handling, okay, very nice, I think. Learning curve is between the microsurgery and the one portal endoscopic surgery. Also, we can do uh, fusion surgery under endoscopic control. But there is a significant individual learning curve and with long-term investment we have to do. So challenges. Triangulation is not easy, especially for neurosurgeon. Okay? So create, creating artificial working space also is not easy. So we have to make a good working portal and we need proper water passage. So my concerns of bipolar endoscopic surgery. Also, I had a dual injury at the learning curve stages. I have, okay? So be careful. Also, we have to think about intraspinal pressure problems. So also, I don't recommend overuse of endoscopic surgery. We can do it, but we cannot solve all the spinal problem with endoscopic surgery. So I don't recommend tumor surgery. Some Korean surgeons, endoscopic surgeons, doing uh, surgery, uh, intrathecal, intramedullary, uh, extramedullary tumor, but I don't recommend. We can do it, but it's dangerous, I think. So if, I don't recommend also deformed correction surgery. We can do it, but it takes a long time. Let them do it. Okay. Also, compressive revision surgery. Sometimes I don't recommend, but we can do it. Okay, so future of UV's technique is not limit. The surgeon is the limit. So we can collaborate in navigation and robotic surgery. So bipolar endoscopic spine surgery would be promising MISS. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Amazing talk, Thank sir. You. Yeah. You've taken us through the world of UB. Beautifully <laughs> yeah. put in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, Dr. Hayati now to please share his screen. Sir, can you stop sharing your screen, sir? Dr. Yumjinma, yeah, thank yes. you so much. Wonderful talk. Amazing. Thank you so much. Nice. Okay. Dr. Hayati, can you start your talk, please? Screen, brother. Let's see in my presentation. you see my presentation? Yeah, we can see you, sir. And we can see you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank uh, again to Dr. Malcolm and Dr. Same for their good activity and their valuable invitation for me. And then uh, I also want to thank uh, the Dr. Aison Kim, Dr. Mark and Dr. Michael Pelstoyki and also Dr. Sami and all the other our faculty for their very valuable uh, support for me in Turkey, Bursa in uh, February. We are exciting uh, and uh, waiting for your coming. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will talk about the complications of the UB. The previous uh, speakers has very uh, nice presentations, but they talk about the nice aspect of the UB. Then uh, I will talk about the bad side of <laughs> the UB 
and briefly in a 10 minutes. Okay. Yes, you know, the uh, have some complications. And, uh, the, and those complex surgeries uh, promising a very nice uh, benefit from the uh, for the patients and the surgeons, but also they have uh, very severe complications. The complications can be talked under the uh, three main uh, topics. And uh, we also I try to prepare this uh, presentation based on the, the patients and the, some complicated cases uh, and their feedbacks. So yeah, I will uh, I can uh, talk under the three main topics. I saw the complications the, the it can cause from the surgical technique and it can cause some patient related uh, factors and also it can cause from post-operative management. If you talk about the surgical technique related complications, uh, in the surgery, uh, most of these complications arising from the, the poor surgical technique, unfortunately. It, we can uh, talk, uh, we can say that most of them is coming from the skill-based complications. The surgeon can uh, make inappropriate surgical working space. Maybe they will uh, do the, the miss, uh, they can miss the cornerstone during the surgery. And also maybe because of lack of enough experience that some of the surgeon can unrecognize the endoscopic anatomy. Uh, and some of complications also are coming from the, the lack of knowledge wrong indication, wrong patient selection, and wrong technique selection. And others, I saw in, especially in some experienced surgeons, the over self-confidence can cause very devastating complications. So we have to be careful about this. I saw then many uh, surgeons, uh, it has over, uh, self, they have uh, over self-confidence, they have uh, inappropriate and non conformite procedures they're doing. They're trying some things on the patients. And also, uh, they have also excessive optimism or they have some unrealistic. So many must, the others have uh, irresponsible, uh, the manner is, is irresponsible. They don't care about the literature or the basic knowledge, they just, looking at the short time results. Maybe they can uh, obtain by using some medicine. So what is the solution? Yeah, for the, uh, we have to improve our surgical skills, of course. For this, the surgeon should follow the learning steps. The surgeon should learn about the cornerstone and check the location during the surgery especially unexpected, uh, unexperienced surgeons. And we have to be fair at endoscopic anatomy. The other, we have to choose our technique by using exceptional literature. You know, there are many, many papers in the literature you can see, but it's uh, most of them may be, unfortunately, is untrustable. For example, sometimes uh, we, refuse or we unaccept some uh, the papers in, for example, in one uh, in uh, one journal, but then you can see this paper accepted as an accepted paper in another journal. So you have to choose the literature very carefully. Then we have to know the surgical indication is not enough for uh, surgery in endoscopy. Yes, you can see, you can, you have uh, some indications for spine surgery, but we have to consider if is it appropriate for endoscopic surgery or minimal invasive surgery or microsurgery or open surgery or uh, etc. So, 
And also we had, uh, we have obtained the enough technical and the OR conditions uh, for the successful surgery and the without and the complications. So also we have to know that all of techniques have some limitations. Always we have to care about the protecting innocent tissues and also we have to protect patients and also we have to assess our result after surgery and also we have to consider about to obtain the mid-time or long-time results instead of uh, the, the short-time results. When you ask the surgeon why you do this, they say that, but after surgery, the patient was patient-free, pain-free. It is not enough for us. So if we look at the complications related, instrument-related complications, we can see this. Most of uh, complications during the surgery can cause the, the using the, the tool usage, for example. Punching the neurogenic, neurogenic tissues is possible. Neural tear, nerve injuries, neural injury because of some osteotomes, and the radiofrequency related complications can be seen. Direct radiofrequency exposure of the nerve roots or dura can cause the uh, constant uh, neurological impairment. And also, excessive radiofrequency usage can be. Uh, increase the fibrotic uh, developments or uh, the osteoporosis or some uh, instabilities. And also the other very useful tool is high-speed tools or birds. Arthroscopic birds is very useful devices, but it is can be very dangerous. And the complication related with the high-speed birds also and also the, the, the bur arthroscopic bursts can be devastating. So we have to be careful about this. And the others, the traction complications can cause the, uh, the transient or constant uh, neurogenic impairment. So what is the, uh, the solution? You should be gentle during the surgery. We have to be careful about using the chelison punches which is caused the dural tear mostly. And we have to don't use some exceptional tools without enough experience. For example, some uh, osteotomes can cause the nerve injuries. We have to use lower energy after seeing the dura, the radiofrequency, and avoid from the direct radiofrequency exposure to neurogenic tissues. And we have to use appropriate size and shape of birds. Also, we have to keep in mind about the Bernoulli's principle during the during the uh, high speed birds or uh, arthroscopic tour birds, because the Bernoulli's principles can cause the dural tears or nerve root injury. Even you closed. The, the drainage hose of drill or handpiece. You have to be careful about this. And also, we, if, we, if possible, we have to use the bird. Also, the surgeon should avoid from excessive uh, retraction of the root and spinal cord. We have to obey the fluid management. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the, the other complications can we talk under the, the topic, which is the hydrostatic pressure related complications. We can see this some central nervous system complications, ophthalmic complications, we have two cases, headaches, dizziness, and etc. So the solution, we have to avoid from the excessive, uh, so we have to obey the fluid management rules. We should keep the pressure about 30 to 50 millimeter mercury, we have to keep the, the head of table up position at least 10 degree. It can cause, it can help to reduce the, 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 the nervous, uh, central nervous system pressure. And also we have to be careful existing ophthalmic or CNS pathologies like glaucoma or uh, hydrocephalia. 
Now, this is the very uh, hard case. You see the disk dazed to do it very strictly. This case was uh, the, the scoliosis case, and we did the decompression, but because of uh, severe adhesions, now we have uh, the dural tear, the anterior cord. If you have unacceptable dural tears, like um, the if it, the, if this uh, dural tear can be it could be in the in the it would be in the the posterior aspect of the, the spinal cord, maybe we will do the the revision surgery for this. But in anterior, we can put just taco seal is enough. And this case was uh, 35 years old, male. After surgery, the patient say that I cannot see the under uh, the half of my uh, my uh, seeing uh, area. We surprised then you see very severe retinal bleedings, board of sight. But luckily after 20 days, uh, it became spontaneously. Yeah. Now let's see the patient and the complications. If the patient has some comorbidities, of course, we have to be careful about the management of the surgery and after surgery period. And also it can cause the, the skeletal system can cause or can increase the, some uh, the complications. And also if the patient has some existing factors, for example, previous surgeries or uh, job related conditions, also we have to be careful about this. So to manage the patient related complications, the patient selection and pre-op uh, evaluation is very, very important. We have to give enough information to patients about the possible results. We have to put drain. Also, we have to make appropriate plan for the surgery time because the long surgical times can cause very severe problem, especially in comorbid uh, cases. And also, in deformity, we have to learn and we have to apply the, the spine biomechanic, biomechanic rules, and we have to follow the osteoporosis can cause devastating complications. So we have to know how we can manage the, the osteoporosis. And we have to use advantage, uh, advanced uh, strategies in, uh, in case of deformity. And we have to learn previous surgeries and we have to make our plan. Then we have to consider patient job for postoperative management. For example, if the patient needs a longer time uh, sitting, of course, you have to burn if they have uh, to make to job in heavy works. So we have to burn again the patient to prevent uh, some complications. Yeah, this is the postoperative period with complications, hematoma, infection, valve problem, and early and over activities also can cause some problems. Hematoma is very scary complications. We have some complications, we have some uh, cases, but this I will show you now. If you uh, uh, even uh, putting the drain, you can face with the, the hematoma. This is the case, you see, we did the operation, but in MRI, you see very, very severe complication. Then this is pre-op and post-op, you see post-operative MRI. And then we did the revision uh, for removing the, the, the hematoma. This is another case. It was uh, neurologically intact before the surgery. Then we did uh, the two level uh, unilateral biportal endoscopic stabilization for this case. But after 24 hours, 
the the patient neurological status was Asia B, Asia B for lower extremities. Then when we take the MRI, then we see very, very severe hematoma. Uh, then we did, this is the, the contrast, you see very severe hematoma. Then we did uh, revision for removing the hematoma. And also during the surgery, we can cause the instabilities if you have excessive uh, facet joint, facet joint uh, the, the resection, uh, you can cause instability, of course. Uh, also, it is possible if you have a uh, wrong portals, you can cause the base of sinus process fracture and you can uh, face with the wrong level surgery. And also you can uh, do the incomplete surgery. So we have to protect the facet joint capsule, especially. We have to choose correct partial par uh, portal points for this. And always uh, it's double check your actual position during the surgery is important for preventing wrong level surgery. And uh, we have to follow learning process strictly to prevent the incomplete surgery. Conclusion, endoscopic span surgery has many complications. Most of complications are preventable. post preoperative evaluation is important for reducing the complication rates. Following the learning steps is important to reduce the, the, the complications. And early management and intervention for complications can be helpful for preventing the constant problems. And I want to invite you again, our meeting. It is the Champions League of the Bird. Thank you for your uh, patience. Dr. Pestonji? My video? Okay. Uh, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Are you are you here? Are you there? The fantastic talk. It takes courage to talk about one's complications. Thank you. Senior practitioners should come out with the honesty that you have expressed yourself with. This is an amazing talk, and I really appreciate your courage and your thoroughness in what you have spoken. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Ayati, wonderful. I really have no questions for you. Dr. Yum Jinwa, are you with us? Dr. Yum Jinwa, are you with us? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. I have one question for you, sir. Yes, sir. Why not we change from T lift to X T lift permanently? Why do we yeah. have in our inventory and why not we teach and why not we keep X T lift only? The reason why I'm asking you this question, Dr. Yumjinwa, is because in my talk, which is going to be the next talk, yeah. you are going to see that in my journey in X T lift, I have come across many cases of root adhesions, root entrapment, yes. and these result in foot drops, these result in post-operative neural injuries if they are not taken care of. I feel, I mean, I personally feel that securing the exiting painful route, if the patient has a listhesis and if the right leg is painful, I prefer to go and explore the entire right route. Therefore, I have now changed from T lift to a complete X lift in all cases. I have changed that and this is my suggestion that I think for the coming generation of doctors who are going to join us in the journey in endoscopic T lift, I think we should shift to X lift completely. Because I have now made it a rule to check the route from axilla to outside the SAP. Mm -hmm. I make sure that every route I operate upon is completely in my visual field. It's completely free. Okay. <laughs> So this is my suggestion to you. I think we should cancel the category of T lift and yeah. this. I, no. I, I'm mm -hmm. for your opinion on that. 
So this very nice suggestion and your idea is very nice. I agree, totally agree with you. But sometimes for freshmen and beginners, they not agree. Also, and in America, uh, they are now developing a expandable cage, maybe some business like that, okay? But still, I don't agree expandable cage. Okay. Yeah, big cage will be fine. It's but a little fine. technical difficult, but we can uh, get over that kind of limitation. Totally, I agree with you. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Nice talk. Uh, I'm just going to share my talk. Where is my desktop here? Huh? Okay. Where is my talk? Yeah. My talk is here, and I'm going to launch my talk. Can you guys see my talk, please? Is yes, it? yes. Talk, come on. So I'm going to start, and here we are. Now, I have uh, developed a small variation in the uh, process of doing tea leaf. I call it Dr. Malcolm's X flavor tea leaf technique. And I follow certain new anatomical landmarks, which I have accidentally come across through the hundred I've done. And today I feel that I should share that with you all. So please bless me. We start with the standard targeting, standard portal. The working portal should be in line with the end plate so that, you know, we can put in our cage because basically UB, basically UB is a one-handed surgery. It's not a two-handed surgery. One hand holds to give you visualization. But your operative hand is just one. So therefore, this little change in thinking came across. Let me play this video and you will see that I've already put in bone graft. I've created the end plates. But when I come out, you don't see any dura. I have retained the entire flavor. I go to the flavor separation zone with the upper lamina, but I don't open it. I put in my cage and then I do the phlebotomy after having done all the bone work. Phlebotomy is the last 10 minutes of the surgery. Here you can see how slowly and nicely I'm opening up the flavor edge and then going upwards to expose the rest of the dura cord. So now what is the advantage? The advantage is I have 100% protection of the dura. I have no problems with the dura. I have not had a dural tear, a dural pull, a dural partial tear, arachnoid being seen, no, nothing like that. So with the extra flavor surgery, what I do is I remove the IAP and I just cut across the lamina until I reach the flavor separation zone, but I keep the flavor there. Even if I have to do contralateral decompression, contralateral uh, opposite foraminal decompression, I do all that extra flavorly only. It complements the rationale of UB being a one-handed surgery. You can see the pirate, that's me, with a sword in one hand, that is the operating instrument, but the hook is basically the scope. It identifies and secures the exiting nerve root, which is the most crucial element in surgery, and it causes pain. It provides a green corridor to identify the disc and placement of a cage without fearing or injuring a nerve root. But what is this it? Why am I saying it? Why am I keeping the it hidden? It has a detethering effect on the axillary, which is what I will show you and prove to you, and the exiting nerve root. But what is this it? So the it, we come to the story of the it. The it is the inferior communicating vein that accompanies the exiting nerve root. See, the human anatomy is fixed, but unfortunately, unfortunately, we've never bothered to see this anatomy in detail. When we use a plasma, it has a penetration of only 0.5 mm. And in a low power coagulative mode, that is a blue mode, even that is not achieved. So I'm very safe when I can say that I'm caudal to this. This vein is caudal to the root by 2-3 millimeters and I am caudal to it. When I chase this vein into the axilla, when I chase this vein across the traversing nerve root, and I chase it under the axilla, I am absolutely safe. It is like giving me a green corridor for an organ transplantation, where the police clears up the highway and the ambulances run at mad speed from one town to another to deliver a fresh organ. It's the same highway that I use, the same concept that I use in doing my XT lifts. Now, Look at this anatomy here. 
when you see this anatomy, you will realize, and I will take you to the next slide immediately because there I have marked it out. You can see beautifully the vein that is following the exiting root. The vein that follows the traversing root, it forms a triumvirate. How the Roman Empire was split between three people and there were three Caesars. Likewise, in this axilla over there, there are three major veins. These veins, they tether the root. See this anatomical diagram. Take your time to see it. What I can show you here is that I have cut the laminar bone right up to the flavor separation zone, superior pedicle, transverse process corner. I have osteotomized the SAP. I have kept the entire flavor track intact. I can see inside the SAP. I can see its tip. I can see outside it. I can see it in three dimensions. That means floor. I can see the root accompanying the vein. I can see the vein accompanying the traversing root. Now, this is my heaven. This is my safe zone. When I'm there, I know nothing can go wrong now. However bad it be, however adherent it be, however tight three list this is, this guides me. I'm showing you a video in which I'm chasing the nerve. I'm chasing the vein. So see how I'm chasing the vein and I'm going right up into the axilla. Nicely, I've removed the bony structures the way I've described. And now I'm at the superior pedicle transverse process corner. I'm opening up the axilla. I can even see the sliver of the traversing vein over there. So that was this video. See the next video. Same patient, I'm manipulating. I'm mobilizing the veins. You can see how that thick partially cut vein is there. You can even see an aberrant vein going downwards towards the traversing root vein. And now I must cut all these. But pay attention to the disc. As I cut this vein away, you can see as though the root is literally falling off that bulging disc and off that listhetic fold. And you can see how nicely the root is now floating, mobile, pulsating with the fluid column. So it causes a detethering effect. See this third stage of the video of the same patient. And you can see how beautifully we have prepared the end plates. Dura is not seen. The exiting route is from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, completely visualized. Cage is in. I'm turning the cage, making it horizontal. India is a poor country. Please forgive me. I use titanium cages. But I've used a large cage. And the next slide is what we have done. I have done a para UB take XT lift. I went outside and did the XT lift. See the cage, see the result. I think I'm quite satisfied with the reduction and positioning of everything. So this is what I'm trying to tell you that once you are able to target and see these vessels, you can do anything. Sometimes when I open up the foramen, there is severe lipomatosis, massive amounts of fat, nothing can be seen. I'm scared, where is the root? What do I do? I search for the vein. Gently, I can see the vein here. I can see the vein nicely over here. So sweet baby sitting here. And now I can start using my plasma wand, turn it towards the cut SAP surface and push along it, push up into the axilla. And you can see the triumvirate. You can see the three veins, the vein coming from below the axilla, the vein going with the traversing route and the vein that is coming with the exiting nerve. Cut it and see how the same, same kerosene, blunt, closed mouth, just pushing away, opened up the space and now opening up the disc. So it is a persistent, consistent anatomy. You just need to look for it. Playing again this video, you can see how badly tethered and adherent this root is to the surface. Same three veins, same cutting the veins, securing the entire nerve root right from axilla to outside the pedicle, going up through the axilla and pulling out an up-migrated disc fragment. This is what Dr. Pompabit was talking about. I'm doing it routinely. But through UB, he is doing it through monoportal. Two minds working in the same direction. See the next case. This patient came to me from elsewhere with four screws in her back 20 years ago implanted. The top screw screws are not doing anything but just expanding the facet joints, remove them. The screw to the right appears to have caused fusion, but the screw to the left, the left leg had severe pain and listhesis. So what do I do? I have to think of doing something. I have to think, how will I solve this problem? So I remove the top two screws to hell with them. Not my problem. 
I fracture the SAP. I strip it and when I'm pulling it out, I can see how badly plastered and adherent this root is. If you're not careful, you don't gently strip this, you can have nerve root damage. This is exactly what I was talking about, Dr. Yumjinwa, that we need to shift to X T lift in all cases. And here you can see the three veins at the bottom. You can see how nicely I'm going to now push open, expand open my thing. My root is to my side. I've secured it. I'm confident I'm coming out of the SAP. Now my surgery is going to bring me success. And believe me, it was a wonderful success. So keeping these veins, keeping this corridor, can you see how badly and tethered that root is? It is still not giving way. I had to struggle and I did struggle to push it away, strip it away, open up the whole corridor and get to the bottom of and onto the discal surface. So I prefer to use these veins. You can see the vein with the traversing root too. Here you can see that I opened up a small sliver or a corner of the traversing root. So this is the result. And in this case, since the other facet was fused, I did not remove that screw, accepted it, did only a unilateral fixation, which is actually a bilateral fixation. This is again a case where I'm not able to get below the SAP. I'm not able to cut around the SAP. What you can see here is a complete superior articular process. The IAP is gone. The dura is in front. I'm trying to come around the SAP and I'm not able to. I'm not able to push in there. I'm scared. Is there some nerve root trapped there? Will I injure the nerve root like in the previous video? So, but I see the three veins. Now, moment I see the three veins, you can see the three veins here. I decide okay, now I can do an osteotomy. I gently do an osteotomy of the SAP overhanging part, push it away and you can see the discal surface nicely and beautifully below it. So this is the anatomy that I'm talking about. This is the anatomy that has been there for ages, but we have been missing it. And once you cut it, you can see how beautifully the root has shifted away. I've gone below the root. I've moved it out of my working zone. I can nicely prepare an X T lift corridor. So this is again a super extreme case of lipomatosis. Again, a degenerative uh, lyticlysthesis. And see over here, you can see the vein. And once I see that vein, I know I cannot hit anything. I can see both the veins. Let me just burn everything in between. Let me take care of it. It all disappears by using the plasma wand. It is my safe space. There is not much of collapse in this case. In the previous case, there was a lot of collapse. The triumph weight was very close to the lower pedicle. Now it's away from the lower pedicle. You can see some aberrant veins over there. They are not the primary veins. I'm going to tear them out. That up there is a primary vein accompanying the root. There is a, a primary vein accompanying this root. Tearing it all open and then preparing my grounds for putting in a cage. So the same anatomy, just reclassified, reworked upon, rethought about. But in difficult cases, it's like a beacon of light. Work towards the SAP, find the triac junction, and then move upwards. Especially in collapsed grade two, grade three listesis, makes your life very, very easy. So what is my take home message? What may be trivial to an open spine surgeon, he may not even think about it. He just sees bleeding there and he burns it and packs it. For me, is a lifeline. It's a beacon of hope in a very tight spot. UB is basically a one-handed surgery as such and has very different demands than compared to other types of spine surgery. So I will not compare to monoportal. I will not compare to transforaminal. But I feel that UB gives me complete control over the root. It makes sure that if there is anything there, any associated pathologies, I can take care of them very beautifully. It offers unmatched safety in difficult cases because the root is in my control. I can see my cage going beyond it beautifully, not even touching it. So these new anatomical considerations are a must for an UV surgeon to understand and acquire and search for in his journey. I hope you have enjoyed this talk. So. I shall stop my share here. Dr. Anand, I see you online. Can you unmute yourself? And I'm open to receiving any questions, but I think we will take the questions after Anand's talk. So Anand, can you please share your screen and can we get on with our program?
Yes. First of all, good evening to everybody and season's greetings to all my esteemed friends and the world-class endoscopic surgeons which we have here on the board today. You're praising me for no rhyme or reason. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yeah, we can see you, sir. Okay, so I will be speaking on uh, philosophy of lumbar foraminoscopy and the present state of uh, transforaminal endoscopy and the advances what we are doing in our regular practice. So friends, we all know that the traditional spine surgery for a degenerative spine involves tackling the disc surgery and uh, stenosis decompression surgeries and uh, the conventional uh, way to tackle this was large exposures cutting out the spinous processes the muscles were elevated and stripped off the lamina was cut the facet was cut so basically it was a challenging approach for a very small pathology in the depth and we had to go through several layers and particularly difficult in obese and comorbid patients now, if you see the literature, most studies show you that post decompression, there was decreased leg pain in nearly 70% of the cases, but it was not the case with the back pain. And why this was, this was due to the collateral damage of the surgery. Now, what is the final goal in case of uh, these pathologies? It is the decompression of the nerve and which has to be very safe and precise. Now, this collateral damage, which was caused due to the invasiveness of our procedure, increased the post-operative morbidity. Now, with this understanding, uh, operating microscope was introduced and microsurgical techniques were developed, various instruments and retractors were developed. Too. And what were the lessons learned? microsurgery decreases the collateral damage. But yes, it required discipline. It required pre-operative planning. It required access strategy. It required respecting the anatomical pathways. Now, simultaneously, tube systems and mini speculum approaches were developed to reach the spinal canal. And essentially, three approaches were explored. The interlaminar approach, the translaminar approach, and the foraminal approach. Endoscopic techniques were being developed parallelly and with the introduction of the percutaneous nuclear extraction method by Dr. Hijikata, the transforaminal endoscopy evolution started. Later on, Dr. Parvez Kambin defined the safe triangle and Dr. Anthony Young described this inside-out technique for the transforaminal approach. Simultaneously, the interlaminar techniques were also evolved and developed. The UBE was developed. But now let's see what, by definition, we mean of minimally invasive surgery. It means that doing only what is necessary and dealing with the pathology without disturbing the normal anatomy and physiology. What is minimal access surgery? It is accessing the pathology with minimal destruction of the intermediate normal tissues. And what is natural orifice surgery? It is utilizing the natural orifices and windows in the body to access the pathology. Now, lower down here, we see three representative diagrams of various techniques. And you can very well appreciate that the transforaminal endoscopy has the least mark and it's the least invasive. So let us see, I will showcase some of the different indications where we use these uh, transforaminal endoscopy successfully coming to the down migrated herniation. Now, even in case of an extremely down migrated herniation, transforaminal endoscopy is a very safe and easy approach. First of all, because we do it under local anesthesia. We dock our endoscope just below the pedicle. We identify the bone and with a burr, we just create a small window 
Now herein we are not disturbing the discal anatomy because disc is part of the three joint complex and we do not want to disturb it. We only want to tackle the herniation. So with a blunt hook, we can just manipulate and bring the herniated fragment in our field and grab it under the endoscopic vision. And this is the free dural sac in the lateral recess, which is very well seen through the bony window, which we created. And mind you, this is absolutely a stitchless surgery. So there is no collateral damage. Next case. Now, in case of up migrated herniations, usually they migrate up in the hidden zone between the two roots because that's the path of least resistance. And to approach this area, we need to cut a lot of bone if we approach it through the interlaminar or mind you, even the paraspinal approach because we need to tackle the parse bone. Whereas in case of transforaminal endoscopy, it's very easy. You just identify the exiting root. You just identify the Malcolm's described vein. And then you can just go inside and cut that tissue anchor, which is anchoring that up migrated herniation there. And through this window, now you can put your blunt hook to tease that up migrated fragment in your field. So while you're doing it, you can also cross check in your CM that where exactly is your lie and slowly tease out the complete up migrated fragment and bring it in your endoscopic field. Once that is done, it is very easy. You just need to grab the base of the fragment and get it out. So even the operative time in these cases is reduced drastically. There is no soft tissue clearance. There is no excessive use of RF. There is no excessive bone cutting, no drilling. And herein we can see the free traversing route and the exiting route and up migrated fragment is out. Let's go to the next indication. Discogenic parda equina. Now herein, the pressure on the dural tube is through the anterior side and putting a big foot plate instrument from the posterior aspect can further jeopardize the already compressed nerve roots. Whereas transforaminal approach affords you a very safe approach and you can just go underneath the annulus through which the disc fragment has mushroomed out, create a small nick and again use a blunt probe to just tease the fragment inside your endoscopic channel. And without hurting the roots or the dural tube, you can get the entire herniation out and you can visualize the decompressed sac. Next indication, extraforaminal herniation. Now, extraforaminal herniations are extremely painful and they are, they are very difficult to tackle, particularly in old patients with multiple comorbidities, bad patients for anesthesia. Transforaminal endoscopy is very easy way to tackle this. Just put the endoscope, identify the root, and just tease off that extra foraminal fragment. And grab it out. Everything is done under local anesthesia and minimal sedation. And this is the free exiting route. Very well decompressed. This is the post-operative MRI recreation of the trans, uh, the foramen. And this is the happy patient. The surgery is very gratifying. Coming to the stenosis. Now herein you can see there is lateral recess stenosis due to an 
anterior osteophyte. So tackling this from the posterior aspect is very difficult. Whereas here in under local anesthesia, without damaging the collateral tissues, we can directly enter the foramen, land on that bony excrescence, break it and bring it out piecemeal. And with further soft tissue decompression, you can very well see the decompressed dural tube there, the axilla, as well as the exiting root. So no paraspinal muscle stripping, no burring. Another case of a foraminal stenosis, severe foraminal stenosis around the tip of the superior articular process. So under local anesthesia, again, you can do it through the foraminoscopy. A simple slow burr can be used to undercut the tip of the superior articular process. So actually, this is the same thing what we do in a paraspinal approach, but through a different angle. So once you clear off the tissues, the lateral expanse of the ligament flavum, you can very well access the lateral recess. And your roots are completely free. So this is some RF being used to shrink the axillary tissue. And the entire foramen is now very well decompressed. This is the exiting route. And as we turn the cannula and the endoscope, we can see the lateral recess decompressed and a nice traversing route and the lateral edge of the dura. This is the post-operative MRI showing the free nerve there in the foramen and the lateral recess decompression. The same technique can be used for putting a transcambin cage and doing a facet preserving surgery. All these images are courtesy Dr. Malcolm Pestanji, who is who has mastered this technique. So basically, advantage is superior visualization of pathoanatomy. It's the least invasive. It's possible even in unfit and difficult patients. Simple post-operative management and complications are minimal. And even if they occur, they are very easy to rectify. Drawbacks. Yes, as already mentioned before, it definitely has a longer learning curve and there are less training facilities presently for transforaminal surgery. And then there is investment into the costly instruments. So friends, thank you very much for your patient listening. And thank you once again. Hope you have liked it. Malcolm can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Anand. Exclusive talk by an exclusive transformative surgeon. Genius in this world. I really appreciate you, Anand. You make difficult surgeries seem so, so easy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Up to you. And I think there's a new generation of upcoming transformative surgeons whom have a lot to learn from you. So, I would like to now conclude our talk and I'm just waiting for a vote of thanks from Dr. Vishal Kundani. Are you with us, Dr. Vishal? Hello, Dr. Vishal Kundani, are you with us? I think he must be busy in the OT or something. So, I want to say a th personal thank you to all the speakers who have removed their precious time effort to put across such beautiful views to the world today. So once a big thank you from 
ऑर्थो टीवी एसिकॉन वर्ल्ड फेडरेशन ऑफ स्पाइन एंडोस्कोपी एंड टू ऑल द स्पीकर्स एंड टू डॉक्टर समय फॉर हैविंग रिमूव टाइम फॉर अस थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू वंस अगेन बाय बाय आई थिंक वी कैन लीव आवर मीटिंग जस्ट वन सेकेंड there's some two chats so let's see what it is why did retinal bleeding occur was one of the questions that has been asked to us yes when you have severely raised intracranial pressure because of epidural pressure rising and because of the patient having a head down position that is why dr hayati mentioned something that when i do my surgeries i keep the head up by 10 to 20 degrees this is an auto correction that you achieve otherwise when a patient is on a wilson's frame and you have broken the frame to try and get lordotic um, correction and to get a flat back the head is lower than the back if the surgery is over a long period of time you can have punctate bleeding in the retina so better is at such times to please keep a correction to be done so that is the one question that was asked and i don't know whether there's any other question now there are two new messages so let's have a look at them dr bal gopal thank you so much for having been with us thank you so much i think we can conclude safely now thank you so much everybody once again thank you good day and i formally close this meeting thank you so much